welcome everybody to our Colorado City School Safety and Security Committee meeting here September 13, 2022. Appreciate you all being here. Um, it's certainly uh, it's an important committee to support the work that this committee does. I mean, on, a, on a day like today, you see a situation like uh, what happened at, High, at Heights High School. Where they had a, a scare, an active shooter scare today. And this, it serves as a reminder for all of us that at any moment, anything happens. Okay? And the, the power of what we do, the power of this committee, so many people in here, number one focus is safety all day, but for all of us, our top priority is that, that idea of we don't want to find ourselves in a situation where we need to get ready. We need to be in situations where we stay there. That's the, that's the key to this uh, process moving forward. So today we're going to go through, we'll talk about some, some general information. We will uh, go into the executive session for a portion of the uh, meeting because of the nature of what we'll be discussing. And we'll share any information that we our campus and the rest of the public. And then we'll come back uh, for some more conversation. The end. And really, I think <clears throat> what will be a healthy, uh, interesting conversation for us uh, to consider uh, an idea at the end of the meeting today. We'll, 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 we'll start with uh, item one consider approval minutes from the Common ICD School Safety Security Committee on June 1st. Chance to see those. Are there any motion to approve those? All right, Mr. Biden, I need a second. Any uh, directions or conversation about those minutes? All right, I'll ask your vote for approval. Uh, if you raise your hand, all those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Okay, one, two. All right, I'm two. Receive information <coughs> regarding threat assessment data submitted to the Texas Education Agency. <coughs> and before we get into the Data portion of it. We're going to go through just a brief summary of our threat assessment teams. I know that perhaps some of you may not know what it is that we do in regard to those. So um, once we get that pulled up, we'll go ahead and start. And so, um, Senate Bill 19, Senate Bill 11 in 2019 came out, um, and it tasked us with creating threat assessment teams um, in all of the districts. And because of the district for our size, we made the decision that those threat assessment teams would be at each individual campus. But we would also have a district level threat assessment team as well. Um, the Texas School Safety Center um, was designated to oversee and provide that support, and they also provide the training for Sigma, which is a via the Secret Service, which is really the model that we follow in regard to the threat assessment teams. Um, so, uh, Conrad ISD has threat assessment policies and procedures that comply with the Texas law that came from Senate Bill 11, and then, of course, with the company Texas Education Code. Um, all threat assessment teams are in the process for completing the required training. We'll get a little bit more from that later um, in regards to some of the stuff that we had to do. But just to all keep in mind, due to our size, number of employees that we continuous thing we have to do on a yearly basis, attrition, turnover, adding new employees, etc. Um, and we'll get into that once we um, talk about the data. And then, of course, data since 2020 has been reported to TDA. And so, um, and it gets greater every year in order for what we have to. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot about the mic. I'm usually loud enough. Um, it's gotten more and more for every year on what we have to report and we're going to go over the latest but we do have things in our reporting mechanism to kind of cover what it is that we kind of foresee in the future that will be reported uh, the primary goal just so you all know of the threat assessment teams um, are to determine if a person of concern poses a threat of violence to others themselves or both that is the primary goal of course there is a lot more that goes into it um, than that, any questions, we'd be happy to answer them, or there is a litany of information that's on the Texas School Safety website in regard to threat assessment teams as well. 
Uh, in Conroe ISD, well, first let me back up. The state requirement that comes from the Texas School Safety Center is the requirement is an administrator, a counselor, and a police officer be a part of every one of those teams. In Conroe ISD, we have an administrator, a counselor, an LSSP, or a member of special education there, and then a CISD police officer, and of course, all of those team members are trained or, again, are in the process of being trained. Uh, <clears throat> for the threat assessment process, we have three parts. We have an initial screening report. Um, again, it just goes back to the training that we received from the School Safety Center. The, the initial screener is going to be that guiding document for when a threat is made or a perceived threat is made from a student, where they use that guiding document to make the determination on whether or not a full threat assessment is needed. Um, there's a lot of questions that have to be answered that kind of drive them to whether or not they need to complete that full threat assessment. Um, and then again, the full threat assessment, it's 11 questions developed by the Secret Service. We kind of retooled it a little bit just to make it easier to navigate. I think ours is around 13 questions just to kind of break a couple up to make it a little bit more, not succinct, but uh, a little bit easier to understand at the campus level. And then the third portion of that after the full threat assessment is run is going to be that post assessment and that's going to be the plan put in place by that campus the individualized or not the individualized it's a different whole different area it's going to be a plan that's put in place in order to as they say in the training to remove that student from that pathway to violence excuse me or whatever it is that they deem that that threat was made and so it's just the plan put in place um, to assist that person um, as before we get into the data, do, does anyone have any questions or input in regard to threat assessment teams or threat assessment process and campuses? Nope. Okay. Um, again, state law requires the districts that we report the related data. And of course, um, the data is going to be submitted individually by each campus. That data, it, there's a hard copy version, but then if they use the hard copy version within our student information uh, system, which is view it, um, we break down that paperwork so they can do it electronically. So it makes um, it very easy to aggregate all of that data and put it apart, disaggregate it again um, for what the state needs. So our technology department helps out tremendously. You'll hear here. And then of course, when we get into the other part, the, the great things that they've been able to do for us to make stuff that we have to submit so much easier. Um, so I'm going to go to my drive and pull up that report and we will go for that right now. All right, before we make that transition into seeing that, I want to go ahead and move our meeting uh, to closed session. So this committee will go into closed session pursuant to sections 551.076 and 551.089 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Any action, vote, or decision of the committee with regard to any matters discussed in closed session will be made when the committee returns to open session. The time is now 4.11 p.m. Part of the process that we started this, these conversations in the summer, uh, both the formal piece from TEA and then also the informal piece uh, of just looking at our procedure and comparing ourselves to other districts and see are there areas that we can improve? Are there you know, things that you might call like low hanging fruit, things that, are, that we can quickly go and get and, and make changes? And so we we evaluated a lot of different things along those lines. But one of the things that popped out as we started looking at other districts is the use of student IDs. And we noticed that some area districts required the use of student IDs. IDs be worn by students at all times, which and we can all understand the safety implications of that and the benefits. And as we have now extended our investigation into that, we see that it's gone probably from many to most school districts. That. And at present time, we do not. Uh, and so, this is not a decision to be made by this committee, but we want this committee's feedback uh, to determine that this is something that we need to strongly consider and we need to form a little subcommittee of principals to discuss the, uh, you know, how we do this. If it's something that we would want to consider before bringing it potentially to our board of trustees if it's going to become part of our uh, required dress code moving forward. But uh, as you can see here, the, these are the, the districts and, and uh, 
what grade levels uh, uh, what grade levels that they require uh, them to be worn. And you know, the interesting thing about student IDs is the game has changed, is changing as you move forward. You think about uh, the system that we are going to have in place in the spring semester, where you would use your ID to scan on and off the bus. Certainly makes the ID more important in the lives of the students. Additionally, you know, can be scanned at the cafeteria, the serving points uh, as well. But we've never, we've never required them. Actually, I think we only have one school in our in our school district's history that's ever required them to be one, and that's kind of high school and I was pretty. Um, we, we did it then. So I, I can maybe offer or answer some questions you may have about that, but I would love to, we just want to get feedback today. Uh, as you see this list of, of other districts, and uh, think about the idea of students wearing ID, what are your thoughts? I'll share, you know, one of my thoughts is that in and when we move to ID, I think it's important that the IDs are actually used for every corner. So I think you know, when we look at we need to scan on the bus and scan on the bus every day, we use it in the cafeteria, we use it for a library card, we use it, I think it makes a much better argument than just being a declaration that we're trying to enforce in the dress code. So I would, I would just make the case that I think there's a place for it, but I'd like to see it integrated into a useful tool as well. And so there's, there's a lot of energy that goes into the course of that. It could be a lot of time out of class, it could be a lot of time that people are spending dealing with IDs and not doing other things. We have to know the cost of that, their time. And so to give that up, what are we getting in return? And so I just think that it would be, I think it's important that I would say too, so when we did this research, we wanted to bring you data, good data from districts that somewhat compare to us as far as what are they doing? And I kept expanding and Ethan kept expanding how far we reached because we wanted, I wanted to get a complete view of it and I kept expecting to find a district that said they did not use them or they were considering it. But as we expanded and did research, I think every district that we researched is doing them at least seventh and up or high school and up or secondary. You can read, this is one of the two pages. And I believe to, to speak to Dr. Hines, I believe they're doing this because of concerns for safety and security. I also believe it is synergy with districts like us going to bus monitoring systems, student, student monitoring systems. And just to tell you what it is, if we implement it, we will have a passive RFID card. It is passive. It does not track the kid. We don't know where the kid is based on the card. It's just a card like the card that I have on here that I am able to access with a reader that tells me if I go in a door on a bus or off a bus. It also works with the uh, cafeteria seamlessly and it works with the library. So there will be synergy and use for that card that will be not just cosmetic as far as uh, wearing a really important card. And so looking at it just on the just strictly to buses, the one thing we did a pilot in the spring, I noticed that this is going to sound overly simplistic. The, the bus scanner card machine system, it works a lot better when they have their card. Uh, we can work with just their name, but we really need their card. But I guess just from my viewpoint, I was somewhere between surprised and really surprised at how many districts are already doing this and requiring. And I believe Dr. Knoll did a quick uh, search of some of his superintendent friends. And it's not just something they have on their websites. They're really doing it. Yeah, I did check with three of them today just to get that were on the list as yeses. And I just want to see like, if it's really a yes. And so I did text them and all three of them came back and said, Yes, what we had was accurate data. Are students using them to scan in and out of class to show the you know, attendance? Some schools use them to get into the building. Um, from looking up these, they have scanners at the front that they have to pop their badge up against just to get into the building. I don't know about in the classroom. I didn't read any of that. But to the building, yes, some of them. Seems like you specifically 
That's what I was going to say. That was a great question, Teresa, because if you think about it, then it kind of parlays with the buses, attendance, and all of those things. I think that um, if the synergy is such that other districts are utilizing um, badges to scan in, I think we should move in that direction, absolutely. As a parent of a students that are in the district and a teacher here, it's just imperative that we have that, you know, um, same mindset. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say through the lens of health services, when you look at the whole scope of how we keep students safe during the day, we see hundreds of thousands of children in the clinic that receive medications and treatment in a typical school year. Just would add a second layer um, for that nurse to verify so that that is the student. When you go to other clinical settings, they do have barcodes and scanners and things that 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 nurse can, can verify. And ours in the school setting are, are hampered by that. So having a, a student ID would give that nurse that second identifier of this is the child that is supposed to be here to get this and it is a major investment of lanyards and IDs. We've already made that investment with the student bus monitoring system. It is a recurring investment that we'll make yearly, yearly for lanyards. You know, our, our plans right now are break two breakaway lanyards so they could break away if something happened that was not great. And so we're looking at that and getting quality items. And so, but that's for the bus monitoring system. The, the wearing them or requiring to wear them, that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. so. But if they have it with them, the bus monitoring system works a lot better. And I do think you know, part of this is it's a it would be a giant the long term to get like the, the effects into the clinic or to, if you know we ever got to the point where we were gonna scan them as they walked in the building every day or potentially scan them as a hall pass, whatever that's a that's a large scale infrastructure investment, right? Uh, hu huge. But it is something that may be worthwhile, and we, you know, we are, you know, right now, you know, probably 14 months away from our next bond, and certainly I think there'll be plenty of discussion uh, for the next bond committee about safety and security, and, and certainly key card access to buildings and all those are those things are important. But this, you know, if this system is in place, that committee could consider what's the next step, you know. Do we want to come in and outfit, uh, you know, our, our buildings or at least portions of our buildings with these access points um, to help us track? So, uh, any other thoughts? Living in the middle of little kids and big kids, I feel like the big kids it seems like a good idea in the bigger area of education, but then it sounds like it's really the younger kids that the bus monitoring system is going to work with us for. But when, when we did it at Connor High, and so I was principal, so we followed suit and did it at intermediate, it's a lot. They're not the most like, with it yet. Well, we're teaching them to bring their things and remember, and so there is a lot of remaking of them. So we would just need to consider that, especially with that age of kid before, you know, between mom reminding them every day and trying to learn to be responsible. Like, there would just need to, we just need to think about the number of remaking what that looks like on a daily basis for it's the same experience with the high school kids the elementary kids just don't lose them I do agree though the more they use them the more it's going to be painful if they don't have them versus just the dollar to get it temporary like we've got to figure out a way to make it a daily usage almost a lot of the elementary folks that even from the chart and then the ones that I checked with today were like elementary they just had them on their backpacks and and then when they got to secondary they were they were wearing them you know via lanyard and they utilize badges in college so yeah. that's just the next step that they're going to have to you know be comfortable with that in that environment so employers yeah. and the like yes. exactly my God. <laughs> my God. so i think I that my, yeah. I my work in my car right <laughs> So it's possible to be two things at once. It's possible to be a parent and a CISD staff member, but some of us are parents and not CISD staff members, and thank you for your time. But parents, do you have, does anyone have any thoughts of this as a parent, putting on your parent hat? Certainly. So we actually like 
my kids attended one of these schools up here. Um, starting in first grade, they were uh, it was mandatory for them to have an ID badge. Um, uh, my oldest uh, did a little better than my middle child did in keeping up with it. I think we went two or three, uh, especially the land parents and whatnot. Um, overall, I think it, it worked well. Um, unfortunately, I'm right now racking my brain up what they were required to use it on. I know being the front board, it was a requirement. Lunch, lunch time it was required and I'm pretty sure uh, they were the bus uh, for the first couple of years so I'm pretty sure they would use their the buses as well. Um, I, I think definitely you know high school moving on it would I would say you know yeah it's, it's this is worth talking about and worth uh, looking into for sure. And, and we've talked a lot of, you know we've had conversations with staff and with our principals especially early on that the safety conversations oftentimes run co contrary to adult convenience. And this is absolutely one of them because this is not, it is not easy to manage. It is absolutely um, requires very strong systems and, and it will put a burden on staff because it's a constant every day, nonstop, where's your ID? Where's your ID? Where's your ID? All, you know, all the time. Um, but it, you know, I do think that it, it, if it's worthwhile, then it's it's worthwhile, right? And it's just, uh, I think part of the nature and the concerns that I that I would hear about about kids, like, oh, they're not wearing it on purpose, just to be, you know, just to aggravate. It's like, it's kind of their job, right? Like we were, we've all been teenagers. It's all, it's a teenager's job to push boundaries. Um, if but I would rather live in the world where that's the boundary they're pushing than other boundaries. Like if we can move the line of what we're gonna push from over here from you know really bad activity to, oh, I'm gonna be a rebel today and tuck my ID into my hoodie. Oh, okay, well, we'll deal with that uh, today. But, but it can be done, we've done it. Um, so I, I'm hearing that it is, there's an appetite for the conversation and I think what we need to do you know, we'll, we'll work with the assistant soups to put together a group of principals to um, really talk about this and what, you know, what can it look like and when and how and and then we'll we'll further that conversation. We may be bringing it to to our board in the future to to have consideration on uh, as well. Any other comments or feedback on? I think it also depends on your campus. Mm -hmm. If you have a one campus that doesn't have the big parts where you, as you don't have a, a ninth grade campus and then you have a main campus and things like that. I think that you could probably manage it in a little bit of a different way versus the different type of campus setting. So I think that should be taken into consideration as well. Okay. Yeah. But there are even, you know, you even bring that up like that, that, that in and of itself is a, is a great thing to think about. You know, as we transport thousands of kids in the middle of the school day between ninth grade campuses and senior campuses like we don't scan those kids on buses right now so like you know that that's one way too like if we were in that situation to have those cards have them scanned is one more way to know well, we know that they they left the ninth grade campus and got on that bus to go to the to the senior high like that's uh, that's uh, useful okay any anything else Right. Okay. Well, any other comments on on uh, this or anything that we've we've spoken about today, or any questions for Mr. Barton or Mr. McCord? All right. Well, we appreciate you. Then, gentlemen, thank you, uh, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you for the work that that you all do to lead us through this process. It's a lot, and I will tell you, I I receive all the emails that come in from the state and from the region service center of all these requirements that we have to do and and they're planning webinars and and this meeting and that meeting to help get through and, and of course they're trying to serve all these smaller districts as well and so i get all these things and i forward them on every time i get one i forward it to ethan and mr mccord just to make sure we're good and like I'm reading this email and you can tell that the angst and the stress of these districts are trying to figure out how to do all this stuff and I send it to our guys and Ethan just sends back like 
yeah, ours is done. We did it two weeks ago. I'm like, oh, great. Like, and that's a constant thing that happens uh, for us. We're just lucky that we have um, you know, great dedicated people in these positions with, with the focus on this. So thank you for, for what you do. Thank you all for being here today. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Next meeting. Yeah, we don't have a date yet for the next meeting, but it'll be in the spring semester. And, and uh, we will honor Dr. Hines' uh, motion for adjournment. So thank you. Five eleven.